we've got the recording going. And go ahead and get things kicked off here. So welcome. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, morning or afternoon for you, depending on where you're joining us from, but good morning or afternoon. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for our conversation on how to mitigate cloud migration risk with disaster recovery as a service. My name is Christopher Cruz, and I am the director of cloud marketing here at InterVision. And uh, on behalf of myself uh, and the entire InterVision family, as well as our partners at AWS, I did want to extend a very sincere thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this conversation. You know, this, a lot of thought and effort goes into these presentations, and it's really sparked from the input we hear from our clients and what we hear from the market. And so uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, as we go on today uh, about, you know, what, what you think about what we're talking about, any questions you have. And you can do all that through the chat functionality here in the, um, the uh, uh, WebEx application. So if you have any questions at any point, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, through the chat functionality or through the Q&A functionality. And I'll certainly uh, find opportunities to make sure those questions are addressed. So um, I understand that some of you may know InterVision um, and some of you may not. So just as a quick introduction here, um, InterVision is a strategic service provider with over 25 years of experience helping IT leaders like yourself run, grow, and transform their businesses through a comprehensive portfolio of technology, services, and solutions. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, that all sounds great, Chris, but what does that really mean at the end of the day? And I just wanted to touch on this, this big point here is that more and more, um, we are working with organizations that have cloud first initiatives, right? Big surprise, really all the, all the real transformational technology is happening in the cloud today. But uh, most organizations still have an on-premise data center or multiple uh, data centers that they have to manage as well. And by combining our deep expertise in the data center, uh, we were born in Silicon Valley, helped the uh, giant tech startups of the world build out their data centers. And we've had a history of over 25 years doing that. By coupling that deep experience and expertise and partnerships we have in the data center with our expertise in hyperscale cloud, we're really helping organizations tackle that hybrid challenge and make cloud first a reality in a hybrid world. So it's really our superpower, so to speak, is, is combining that deep expertise in the data center with our deep expertise in hyperscale cloud. And you can see that reflected on our website and the types of case studies and works we're, work we're doing. It's also reflected in our status as a premier consulting partner with AWS with all the accreditations that you would expect from an organization that has hundreds of thousands of billable hours in hyperscale cloud. So with all that aside, it really brings us to our conversation today, that, that hybrid play, making a cloud first reality uh, possible for you. And one of the ways that we're seeing more and more organizations take that big first step in the cloud or move their cloud journey along is by shoring up their disaster recovery and backup uh, uh, capabilities through the cloud. And, and, and that's really allowing them to uh, prove out uh, their cloud initiatives and really get the experience to drive their cloud strategies forward. And that's, and that's really the subject of the conversation today. So um, I'm joined by two guests that I'll introduce in just a moment here, but at a high level, here's the takeaways that we plan on touching on today. Um, you're going to hear some insights from AWS at the industry at large. You know, although we talk to hundreds of clients on a given month, AWS is out there speaking to thousands, right? And I think they bring a, a level of, uh, of depth and expertise across the entire industry. And, and we're going to hear a little bit from them on some insights from, from AWS. We're going to also talk about why are so many organizations looking at disaster recovery as their first step to cloud and what's the benefit of, of taking that as their approach. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about common migration cloud adoption challenges. And we're going to talk specifically about how disaster recovery as a service can help mitigate some of those challenges and risks. And then finally, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our approach with disaster recovery as a service and how we're help helping organizations like yours uh, get the most out of their cloud investments uh, through our disaster recovery as a service solution. So with all that said, we've got two of the best folks I could think of to speak to these subjects today. 
Um, and I'm really, really excited to, uh, to be working with them on this conversation. So Jeff Tun is our strategic IT advisor here at InterVision. And uh, the thing I love about Jeff is that he's every bit as passionate about the people side of all this as he is about technology. He's got 35 plus years of experience in technology. He was a former CIO for a very large retail organization, but he's now leading, uh, helping other IT leaders really realize their capabilities as a, as a as strategic advisor. And he helps us keep our ear to the ground, so to speak, on what's happening in the market, what folks like him as a CIO are really looking to do and, and where their challenges and struggles are. And uh, another cool thing is Jeff is an author, uh, as well as a very, very uh, exciting public speaker. Um, he has multiple works published, and uh, I, I really think you're in for a treat here uh, with his presentation. And uh, our guest speaker from AWS is Rajesh. Uh, he, he said I could call him Rajesh V. I'm going to do my best to pronounce his last name. Vija Ra Avagan, or Vija Gavan. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Raj, I'll... Uh, I'll uh, let you get the pronunciation right there. But he's a, a senior storage business development manager at AWS, and he really focuses on working with small and medium-sized businesses in the Americas who are looking for innovative and cost-effective AWS storage solutions like backup, disaster recovery, and ransomware protection. Um, he has several years of product development management experience and uh, product management experience uh, in the inter enterprise storage and backup product space um, from his experience working at companies such as Cohesity, Hitachi, SanDisk, and Dell. So again, two great speakers, um, and I'm really excited about the conversation. And with all that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Rajesh for his presentation. So I'm going to pass you the buck here, and, uh, and uh, you'll, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me share my content and we'll get going. All right, just a moment here. You should see that coming over. Can you confirm you can see my slides? Not yet. Okay, let me share it again. Sorry about that. No worries. All right, looks like it's pulling up here. How about now? Perfect. Yep, full screen. We're good. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Rajesh Vijaya Raghavan. That's how you spell it, Chris, or uh, that's how you pronounce it. Um, I am a senior business development manager here at AWS. Uh, I have been with AWS for about one and a half years now. And uh, my role is specifically geared towards the America small medium business segment. So I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes, you know, taking you through a typical SMB customer journey with AWS. Uh, we'll cover what are the key workloads that uh, customers come after AWS for, which is basically backup disaster recovery will be uh, portions of it. We'll go through the key value propositions of AWS, um, and we'll also look at some key considerations that uh, customers have to have when it comes to disaster recovery. So let us look into the typical customer journey first, right? So uh, in my experience here and uh, past several years, what I've seen is uh, typically small, medium business customers or even enterprise customers, uh, they have a large on-premises footprint. Uh, and when they start considering the cloud, uh, they first you know, dip their toes in the water uh, using a backup uh, kind of use case, right? Or archival use case. So these are most probably um, you know, non-production workloads, these are like backup workloads, secondary data that they decide to bring to the cloud, right? So uh, they start off with that journey, uh, takes anywhere from three to six months, uh, maybe uh, a shorter time frame if the, if the data set is small. But then after that, they typically go into, okay, now that we have our data uh, within AWS Cloud, uh, how can we think about other mechanisms, right? They need to have a, you know, a disaster recovery strategy 
within that umbrella, they need to think about ransomware attacks and such, right? So that's probably kind of uh, the second stage of their journey into AWS. Thirdly, uh, these are a little bit sophisticated customers, maybe the enterprise customers or, you know, uh, customers that are in between SMB and enterprise, right? Those are customers that are thinking about, okay, I have my data in AWS. I've tried to do disaster recovery planning with the cloud. Now, can I also monetize this data, right? Can I manage this data and create business impacts, right? So there are different ways those customers do, like right? they do data lakes with S3 or they do move to manage file services. They use the EC2, several other services that we have. So first let's deep dive into the backup restore side of things, right? And then we'll talk about disaster recovery. Those are the two phases we'll cover today. So coming into backup, restore, and archive, and again, as I said, customers typically are, are you know, they have an on-premises based uh, environment, or uh, they must be using uh, several third-party ISV products, or, you know, Commvault, Verita, the Unitrends, there are several others in the market, right? So uh, we'll look into this use case first. So why do customers back up data, right? Our customers, again, uh, they have to ensure that there is safety, security of the information that they store. Uh, it needs to be regulated. You know, they need to minimize data loss, right? So they always consider what are the negative implications, right? If they didn't back up their data, they lost some critical customer data, then they're going to lose their brand, the customer trust, and possibly even revenue associated with that data, right? So. Um, so, some of the, you know, um, the decision that they take has cascading effects on underlying systems and services, right? And the cost associated with will be also high if they don't plan accordingly, right? So data keeps changing over time. Uh, customers have to think about, you know, um, how much of their data is worth protecting, uh, which piece of information is critical. Uh, so they take snapshots, uh, they look into the, you know, a recovery point objective and such, right? So minimizing data loss is the key uh, mantra when it comes to any kind of customer, small, medium business or enterprise. Now, uh, the next factor to consider is, you know, recovery time objective. Uh, this is the function of, you know, how much time does a business tolerate not having the application or its data restored, right? So for many businesses in SMB, what I've noticed is, an hour that an application is not online can result in like maybe hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of dollars, right? Think about a Black Friday or a uh, peak season. And if you don't have access to your system or data, then that's going to impact the revenue, right? So the two variables that we will focus in subsequent slides are the RPO, which is recovery point objective, which is the frequency, and the RTO uh, that are the two main drivers of our backup and recovery. Now, uh, the two factors that customers have to, you know, balance is the cost and the risk, right? Like customers uh, typically want to back up all their data, but again, they have to think about the frequency. Is it a daily backup, weekly backup, maybe even, you know, hourly backup, right? So. Uh, you might ask, why not back up everything in real time and provide the lowest RPO, but then that comes with a huge cost, right? So this is where customers need to think about, okay, how much are they backing up and where are they backing this data up, right? They could continue to do it on premises, but at AWS Cloud, it's, uh, uh, it's the most economical. We'll start looking into what aspects of backing up the cloud, right? So, uh, immediate benefits that I see if customers consider cloud-based backup is the durability, availability aspects of the cloud, right? Like they don't have to worry about the infrastructure going down, right? They can leverage existing investments. So let's say they are working with a ISV uh, vendor for backup, right? We have connectors to the cloud and they can leverage those uh, uh, relationship that they have with Commvault or Veritas, any of the vendors out there and just appointed to the AWS cloud, right? It has definitely been cost effective. I've heard it from several small, medium businesses that moving through the cloud, they're able to eliminate manpower needed, storage administrators, or even infrastructure costs. They don't need to think about colo locations, data centers and stuff, right? So it's definitely cost effective. And finally, several customers over the decades have been using tape-based backups, right? While they are economical, 
it still has a big problem, right? Can you recover all that data uh, within a certain, you know, RPO, RTO, right? And there is also the possibility of tapes going bad and such, right? So going to the cloud, you can eliminate those problems that you have. And lastly, these backed up data are not just sitting there just for compliance purposes, right? These can still be used for unlocking insights about the customer base. You can run analytics with the data backed up in the cloud. So definitely cloud brings a lot of benefits to the customers when it comes to backup and PR. As I mentioned earlier, we work with several technology partners. Uh, you know, some of them are highlighted here. Um, you know, Comvault, uh, Actifio, Drua, Rubric, Cohesity. These are all like typical vendors that we've seen uh, SMB customers work with. We have cloud connectors from them onto AWS cloud. So uh, you have several options to, you know, bring up data into AWS and do uh, take care of your backup needs. So oh, moving on to the second phase that I mentioned about, right? So customers back up their data, they archive their data in any of our, you know, S3 or Glacier, any of these classes of storage. Now let's think about disaster recovery, right? Like even when they have data in the cloud, uh, they need to have a mechanism to recover that data if something goes wrong, right? So that's the portion we'll now focus in the next few slides. I like this quote when it comes to disaster recovery. Like when disaster strikes, right? The time to prepare has already passed. So it, we, we want customers to, you know, proactively think about this, not wait for an event to occur and then start planning as to how can they recover data, right? So bear that in mind as we go through the next few slides. Now, disaster recovery, uh, business continuity, right? Why are we talking about it now? Because it's, it's, it's like every business has to think about it. Every business requires data protection. In fact, one of the trends or stats that I saw is, you know, 60% of the businesses, right? This comes from FEMA. 60% of the small medium businesses do not have a BCDR plan in place. And even if customers have these plan, 43% of these businesses do not recover following a data loss event, right? Like this is huge. These numbers are like, this explains what is going on in the ecosystem, right? So, um, when we talk about disasters, you may ask, what is a disaster, right? So uh, it could be anywhere from a natural disaster. Think of uh, tornadoes, you know, or uh, like floods happening or hurricanes. It could take out a colo location or data center, right? It could be infrastructure within the data center going down, right? Like power loss in a data center, network issues, or the, um, you know, the storage arrays uh, uh, malfunctioning and such, right? And lastly, uh, rogue actors, they're always out there every week. We hear about ransomware attacks or something taken hostage, right? So uh, definitely we need to have a contingency plan to work around these issues, right? Lastly, the elephant in the room, the global pandemic, like every customer that I've talked to has been hit by the COVID situation, right? The last one and a half years, and they've been affected by manpower not being available or the work from home issues, right? So definitely planning a disaster recovery, uh, you know, um, of data around these issues is pertinent for every customer. One thing, like you make uh, think like I am a big enough customer. I have some on-premises base, you know, DR in place. Why, why should it be bothering me, right? Like I have an anecdote here, right? Like, in 1998, somebody from Pixar ran a uh, remove uh, command, right? And it deleted like 90% of Toy Story, the movie, right? So surely they had a backup, right? But the backup was corrupted for some reason, right? Uh, and then they had to scramble around and they got lucky, right? One of the technical directors was, uh, you know, on maternity leave and she had taken a full copy of the film on her computer. and they were able to restore it from her computer, right? Like not every company is going to be lucky like this, right? So that's why, you know, uh, we need to think about backup. It could hit the small companies as well as the big companies like Pixar here, right? Now, uh, coming to disaster recovery in the cloud, uh, I want to spend a minute on how it is different than a typical DR on-premises, right? So a traditional disaster recovery requires a large upfront in investment in hardware, right? Like you probably have to, you know, uh, order storage arrays, you need to have hardware, 
for you know fall back fail back mechanism right the data growth also keeps increasing and you have to keep uh, backup uh, and dr hardware also you know linear to your data growth right there is also operational costs you need to have storage administrator you know configuring configuring these systems and it's not just hardware right like uh, it's software licenses and such difficult to test like uh, one you can't simulate like it's very tough to simulate events and test it out in a colo kind of environment right the recovery time is also going to be tough if it's a globally distributed business so if you have colo locations in different places it's going to be definitely tough versus if you think about a cloud based dr you only pay for fully provisioned resources only when needed, right? Like there's no hardware to be managed. There's no software that you need to buy license. It's easy and repeatable. You can easily simulate events and systems can be up in minutes or sometimes even within seconds if you have an active, active multi-site environment. RPO and RTO, I'll quickly run through this, right? RPO is recovery point objective. Uh, just to illustrate, uh, let's say a disaster occurs at noon, right? The RPO is one hour. That means the system needs to recover all its data that was in the system before 11 a.m., right? That means the total data loss is only an hour, right? RTO stands for recovery time objective. So for example, if a disaster occurs at noon and the RTO is four hours, the DR process should recover the system by 4 p.m., right? So these two key concepts are very important for disaster recovery. Now let's go into the business continuity plan or DR plan, right? Like these are things that companies need to assess, right? You need to have a business impact analysis done. This this could this shouldn't be done just by the engineering team, right? This needs to involve the business folks, the storage administration folks. A risk assessment needs to be done, right? Like what happens if my RPO exceeds or RTO exceeds? How much data will be lost or how much business will be impacted, right? And then a business continuity plan, the DR plan has to be chalked down who will take over right when an event occurs who will bring back the systems who will work with these systems and get back the data right and then detecting and testing all these right the disaster recovery plan is very important so let's go into some of those elements right when 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 you do all these plan think about different scenarios right what happens when it's a natural disaster what happens if it's just a single equipment failure what happens if it's a fat finger, right? One of the storage administrator deleted a table, right? So different scenarios need different testing and different recovery plans. A couple of uh, minutes I want to spend on the shared responsibility model, right? Basically, AWS has, you know, availability zones, everything about our data centers, we are going to take care of it. It has 25 regions and, you know, several availability zones. So when it comes to our infrastructure, our power, you know, power distribution, the number of servers, everything, AWS is going to take care of that. The customer does not need to worry about that. When it comes to the customer's portion of the responsibility, it is, you know, securely coming up with these backup systems, finding out your workload architecture, who's going to be in charge of the change management, failure management, what are the quotas, constraints? These are things that the customer has to definitely plan out and this should be part of your DR business continuity plan. And as I said, the bottom portion is everything about the infrastructure, you know, the regions, uh, the availability zones, that's all uh, AWS responsibility in this shared responsibility model. So what are the options in the cloud, right? Um, We'll, we'll quickly look into that. So we have the backup and restore, which I initially talked about. That's the first thing customers consider, right? Again, this is the least expensive model, right? Uh, the RPO, RTO are possibly in ours, right? Uh, customers can use S3 or Glacier, some of our, you know, uh, less expensive for, uh, uh, storage classes, right? In terms of reliability, it is a safe best, right? you get 11 nines of uh, durability across multiple regions. Virtually there is no way this data, you know, will be irrecoverable. You can, you can definitely get back the data. If your system goes down using this method of DR, the system, you know, uh, administrator has to just, uh, you know, upload the data back onto the system from one of these S3 buckets, right? Uh, the cost is going to be the least. As you go from left to right here, the cost goes up, and at the same time, your RPO, RTO comes down, right? 
Next strategy that we have is pilot light, right? It's an excellent balance between affordability and reliability, right? Uh, one of the key differences between pilot light and backup, right? Pilot light will have core functionality running in the cloud. For, for example, um, you know, the data is synced with the database replica uh, that's always on and ready to go, right? Other core services are also, you know, you can uh, uh, start your application with EC2 instance and such, right? So uh, definitely it, the RPO, RTO we've seen here is in the tens of minutes, right? So customers definitely use that. As so we go next to the right, warm standby, right? It's kind of consider it as like the older brother of pilot, right? Right. So, you know, it will include all functionality required for the system as opposed to just the core services, right? With warm standby, a production ready environment is always logged and loaded, so, but it's slightly scaled down, right? This, this saves on cost, but increases, you know, your uh, RTO, RTO will, you know, go down from tens of minutes, it'll go down to minutes. Lastly, the multi-site is best in class, but it's going to be the most expensive, right? It's, it's also called hot standby. In this case, there is a one for one replication of your production environment, right? So it's a fully fault tolerant system. Uh, and you can get back within seconds, right? You can get back and run all your critical services. Last portion that I'm going to spend is testing the DR, right? Like you have to make sure the RTO and RPO SLAs are met, right? So one of the things is an untested DR strategy is no DR strategy, right? Uh, you, you can think that you have a plan in place, but unless you simulate an event and make sure your personnel are ready. You need to have possibly even game days, bring some folks, try to induce an event and see if you're able to meet your SLAs and KPIs, right? These are the key considerations, right? When you come uh, think about recovery steps, like first there should be a detection of an event and then a notification escalation. Somebody has to declare to the company that things happen and failover needs to be initiated and failover needs to be complete, right? Make sure that your you know, detection shouldn't be handled by humans. It shouldn't take a storage administrator two days to find a disaster that has happened, right? So that needs to be done by the system. So a cloud-based DR will be effective here, right? Then the notification and other aspects in the workflow, definitely humans can be involved about where to fail over and whether it's automatic and such, right? So wrapping up, right? Definitely think about using the cloud for backup and DR use cases. We work with several technology partners. Uh, we also work with several consulting partners. Intervision is uh, one of them. Uh, we'll hear more about them today. Use the services that we have. S3 and Glacier are kind of the backbone of the strategy here. We've partnered with several leaders here. So uh, we, we have a lot of blogs and white papers on this as well. So please uh, continue to use AWS for your DR and backup uh, needs. I'll now uh, get it back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Rajesh. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely appreciate your insight there, um, especially considering you know, that, that more and more customers are looking to disaster recovery and backup as their, as their first step uh, in AWS and, uh, and, and your insight on how to get that shored up. So I'm going to take over again here and uh, share the rest of our content for today. Um, and I'd also, I'm going to be turning things over to Jeff Tun on our side. Um, just getting confirmation, Jeff, uh, and uh, are we seeing the slides here? We are. We are. Awesome. awesome. So uh, just turning things over to Jeff real quickly. Uh, the, the reason why I'm so excited to have him join is, is he is a, a CIO and he's going to bring the CIO's perspective on not only what the bigger cloud challenges are as folks look into their cloud adoption journey and what they come up against, but how disaster recovery as a service uh, from his perspective can help mitigate and alleviate some of those risks and concerns that folks see. So Jeff, I'll turn things over to you and, uh, and let you get running here. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. And I know you're gonna, you're gonna run the slides for me. So uh, uh, bear with us everybody as we do that. Um, I really, wanted to start rather than uh, as the title slide just showed uh, cloud challenges i want to start it with benefits what are some of the benefits that cios ac across the the country across the globe are realizing from going to the cloud and 
it really comes down into these three core categories of agility and scale, time and cost savings and resilience. But what, I, what I'd like to highlight here is more than just scale, it's the elasticity that comes from cloud. Yes, you can scale up, but you can also scale down and use cloud economics to pay for what you're using. Uh, if you have a seasonal business that uh, your demand peaks at different points in the year, you don't have to overbuy or oversubscribe the amount of hardware that you have sitting in your data center. You can scale your systems horizontally, uh, and then after your peak season is is by, you can reduce it back down again. The 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 next bar there, what I want to highlight to me, the biggest benefit of moving to the cloud is time. The time that you give back to your teams to work on things that are value add to the business. Not that our infrastructure that are sitting in our data center, I'm not trying to say that that's not value add to the business, but working with those blinking lights and taking care of that hardware, most of the people outside of the IT department don't really stop to think about it. They don't really care. What they do care about is you bringing in revenue, you helping them engage with their customers, and that's what moving to the cloud allows you to do. And resilience, uh, I mean, that's baked into everything we talk about really is disaster recovery as a service is one way, but once you're in the cloud, as Rajesh mentioned, uh, a lot of the, the headaches of keeping your systems up and running from the hardware level uh, and, and the storage level, that's on, that's on AWS. Uh, and you don't have to worry about that. And it is resilient infrastructure and resilient operations. So Chris, bounce over to the next slide here. I find it interesting that some of the benefits are also some of the challenges. Uh, you'll notice that uh, security compliance scalability uh, is uh, one of the challenges. Um, and, and this really points to the fact that as we're moving to the cloud, this is unknown territory for a lot of us, and we have to get comfortable with it. When you think of security specifically and uh, the joint security model that uh, you get involved in where AWS is responsible for part of the security and you're responsible for part of the security, you have to understand where those lines are and where those handoffs are between the organizations. Everybody talks about costs, and it is different switching to the OPEX model from a CAPEX model, and that requires not only IT getting used to that, but you got to get your finance people uh, used to that as well. Um, and then something that is on top of mind for everybody right now are uh, attracting, attracting and retaining talent, and that, those cloud skills are very, very important but they're also a challenge. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a slide or two. And then getting your, your operations on the cloud robust, you have to change your operation procedures uh, to be able to take advantage of the cloud. And people are concerned about that, rightly so, as they're beginning to move in that direction. So Chris, go to the next one. When you dig beneath the layer of those challenges, what, what it really comes down to is there's really three major categories, I guess, is the best way to, to describe it. Um, talent is expensive and hard to come by. Cloud talent, especially so. We're all in this competition for talent. I, I was involved in a program this morning with a university here in, in Indiana, and they had done a study that showed that there are, I wanna say 3.8 billion that can't be right. 3.8 million jobs in the tech space, considering corporate technology and technology jobs. And there's only 1.4 professionals in that line of work. So you're almost 2x uh, with open positions versus people to fill those positions. So that's why we're feeling that crunch on that. The other thing that happens is a lot of times your, your companies will get really excited about going to the cloud and cloud first. But once you start that migration work, you're, they're not seeing a lot of differentiation, right? You're moving things to the cloud. You may not be doing a full refactor of those applications. So to them, it's running just like it was running before. So they kind of lose 
the excitement. Uh, and I already mentioned security and compliance requiring a different approach when you get to that point, when you're, when you're in that uh, dual security model that the, that the clouds use. Those who have already gone in front of you, when you talk to people that are experts or that have experienced other CIOs that have already had their cloud journey or are on their cloud, cloud journey, they really advise people to do a couple of things all around thinking. Think financial from the start. Costs can get out of control if you don't do it wisely. So I encourage you to think about how you're doing it and what you need to do to achieve your cost objectives in addition to your cloud objectives. Think security. How will things be secured in the cloud? How will you interact with your service provider like InterVision and your cloud provider like AWS? And then think steady state. We're, we're really excited about that migration and we're really excited to get our workloads in the cloud. Uh, and then day two comes. Make sure you plan your day two operations in advance. Okay, Chris. Now, I wanna talk about how DRAS can help with some of those challenges and help you well on the road to your cloud uh, journey, your cloud first strategy. So go ahead, Chris. When you think about DRAS to the cloud, disaster recovery as a service, targeted to the cloud, really comes down to three categories of business drivers. We're all looking for a lower TCO, right? That's important to all of us. When you think about the hardware that we spend on uh, our secondary sites and even the cost of the secondary site as well and the, the cost of our staff to support all of those, reducing that TCO is one of the drivers. Geographic diversity, I can tell you from my own experience how important geographic diversity is when you're thinking about disaster recovery as a service. If you listen to our on-demand web series on, on disaster recovery to the cloud, you'll, you'll hear the story of uh, when I was a CIO and we had a, a, a failure because of a, a blizzard here in Indiana, and it also took out our DR data center. Not getting into that one today, but just suffice it to say, geographic diversity is very important. Then the other thing to consider when you're thinking about disaster recovery as a service is what, what's your cloud first strategy? What's your strategy for moving to the cloud? That will help you determine which cloud to target. If you have a cloud first strategy that says we're moving as much as we can to AWS, then you are going to do DRAS to AWS. And DRAS to the cloud, DRAS to AWS is a great first step to get you used to that. We're going to dig now a little bit deeper into those. One of the things that you don't always consider when you think about your DR site is the experience that it's giving to you. This is especially highlighted when you're thinking about the cloud. Think about having a risk-free production copy that when you do your disaster recovery test, you, you are bringing your applications up in the environment in which they're gonna run. You're gonna understand a lot about your applications. You're gonna understand about how they react to being in the cloud versus in your on-premises data center. And your team is gonna learn side by side with certified hands-on experienced experts. So it's a great way to start building that knowledge and building that experience in your people, as well as understanding your applications and how they behave. And our favorite again is TCO. You will reduce your cost dramatically when you use disaster recovery as a service to the cloud. Again, rather than keeping a duplicate uh, data center, a secondary se data center up and operational, you can eliminate those costs you can eliminate the cost of the floor space for that secondary data center and the cost of staff to support both of those things. So TCO, uh, and I know InterVision has some great calculators that can show you uh, based on your own environment what you can expect in that. It's also a great way to demonstrate value quickly as you've got executive pressure of, hey, we want this cloud first initiative 
you get some quick wins because doing disaster recovery to the cloud is probably a lot faster than migrating all your environment to the cloud. So you're gonna be able to show those wins a lot faster. And as I mentioned, you get people familiar with the switch from CapEx to OpEx, not only your team and how to operate within that environment, but also your finance team gets to experience that and begin to understand what it's like to work in that OpEx environment on things that they're used to being in a CapEx environment on. Another thing, and, and we just mentioned this also with, the, with his great Michael Myers uh, uh, picture uh, there about the threat actors, ransomware has become, you know, the new disaster, right? It used to be back in the day, Chris mentioned, I've got 35 years in IT. So it's actually a few more than that, but we won't go into that. Uh, it, uh, back in that time, you talked disaster recovery, you were pretty much talking about natural disaster because there wasn't the internet. Right. Well, now everything is connected. And so you've got this, these, the new threat vectors of people coming into your systems and they've started to attack your on premises backups and your on premises disaster recovery systems. So moving it to the cloud and leveraging the ransomware protection trifecta, as we like to call it, of multi, multi factor authentication on your control planes. Uh, making sure that you have an air gap uh, on your control planes from your on-premises workloads to your cloud workloads, and making sure that you have a copy that is marked immutable. So it cannot be changed under any circumstances. You implement disaster recovery as a service with those three pieces, you will be able to protect yourself from ransomware. You still may get hit, but you will be able to recover from that hit much, much quicker. Now, I want to share a story, a story from the trenches. And, and I want to share it from my own experience of uh, becoming a CIO at a large uh, national retailer, as Chris mentioned. Uh, it's actually Goodwill. If you know my backstory, you know I was CIO for Goodwill for a number of years. And I started there in May. And that's gonna be important here in a second. But one of the first things that you do when you're coming in as the new CIO is you wanna see what your maturity level's like in your organization. So you think about things like disaster recovery, business continuity. I was really excited when I found out that not only did Goodwill of Central Indiana have a DR plan, they also had a B BCP plan, business continuity plan, and they tested it. All right, check the box. We can move on and do something else. Well, about in August of that year, so just a few months later, my senior systems engineer came to me and it, we were getting ready for the annual DR test, BCP test. And he said, Jeff, I know they were successful last year. He was new as well as I was. I know they were successful last year, but I don't know how they do it. They had to use smoke and mirrors. There's no way this is gonna work. I need three months to prepare. So as a brand new CIO, I had to go to my peers on the executive council and ask for a three month delay so that we could get ready for the annual DR test. We tested, we were successful. Fast forward to the next year, uh, and I had a new senior systems uh, engineer, not for any reason related to DR. Um, his name happened to be Jason Fisher, and I saw Jason is on the call today. Uh, so shout out to Jason. But Jason came into my office uh, a couple of months in advance of the next DR test. And he said, Jeff, I don't know how they did it last year. I know you were here and I know it was successful, but man, it had to be smoke and mirrors because I need three months to prepare. Oh man, <laughs> um, did I wanna get rid of that conversation quickly? But we took three months, but Jason and I realized that there had to be a better way. And that's really when we started looking at DR as a service. And we were able to implement DR as a service so that by the next time we were testing, we didn't need three months to prepare. Everything was there, everything was ready. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what that helped us do on our cloud journey. First of all, it gave us time. And I mentioned that earlier, time, time, time. 
Jason was able to spend time in the retail stores and completely redesign the way that the checkout systems worked at the retail level, increasing sales per square foot, which is one of the best measurements of a retail operation. If he was busy doing disaster recovery prep, no way does he have time to do that. We had another person that spent time in our schools looking at the technology that we use to educate our stu schools, our students. They were able to, to completely redo the way we were doing that. Again, we were able to spend time doing things that were far more value add. But here was the other thing that was interesting that happened. When we ran our disaster recovery test and our end users tested the system, they experienced better response time in failover mode than they did from the data center that was down the hall from them. Better response time. It was substantially better. We took, at that point, we shifted our, in cloud, our entire cloud strategy to make sure that our production environment was going to be running in the cloud. And what disaster recovery as a service enabled us to do was we did a lift and shift of our environment to run in the cloud. And then over time, we did the refactors. So all of those benefits that we were talking about earlier, we recognized and were able to see those and prove those in our business. Disaster recovery as a service was a fundamental, pivotal first step for us on our cloud journey. So Chris, I'm gonna to toss it back to you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, I, I, I love that story. And I, I hope that, you know, Jeff walking you through this has helped make some of this real for you. We talked about, of course, from Rajesh's perspective that backup and disaster recovery is really the first step that most organizations are taking when they're pursuing their AWS cloud journey. And Jeff talked a little bit about some of the challenges along that journey with uh, security concerns, expertise concerns, um, and, and how disaster recovery as a service can, can help mitigate some of that by giving your team hands-on experience in the cloud while also uh, giving you more, a more resilient workload and also the capability of recovering from security threats like ransomware. So Jeff, thank you so much again. Rajesh, thank you so much. Really quickly, I'm gonna touch on why organizations choose to work with InterVision for the disaster recovery solution uh, we provide. I'm just gonna hit on some key factors that I think more and more over is really the reason why uh, we've been recognized in the space as uh, leaders in disaster recovery as a service. We do partner very closely with InterVision as a premier uh, partner. You know, I, I meet with the Inter, uh, AWS team, for example, multiple times a week to talk about what we've got going on. And it's really about bringing our legacy as a strategic service provider with a very deep history in disaster recovery as a service. The fact that we provide guarantees backed by L SLAs, that we have 100% testing success rate because we test until things work for our clients. Uh, again, we're backed by some of the strongest SLAs in the industry, and we couple that by providing AWS as the landing zone, and you get all the elasticity, the durability, the cost efficiencies that you would expect from hyperscale cloud in a package solution. And so it's really by working with AWS that we're able to deliver more for our clients. And our capabilities span the spectrum that Rajesh talked about, whether you're looking for an active active environment or you just need you know, a backup option uh, for data that needs to be held for, for years and years. Uh, often we find that when we work with our clients and we start with the business case, that solutions are built across this spectrum, right? That some of their applications need to be in a warm environment, some of them need to be in a hot environment, and some of the, uh, the data needs to be in a cool environment. And we really work closely with our clients to make sure that we're providing as cost-effective solution as possible. On, on, and again, touching on some of the the pieces that Rajesh talked about. And it all starts with our recovery assurance strategy and understanding your unique business requirements and goals before we take a first step in, in designing your solution. It really is important to understand not only the technology impact of, your, uh, uh, of a potential outage, but what does that mean for your business and what are the codependencies of the technology so that we can better formulate the right solution for you and then going from there, we work together with you to design a solution uh, that meets those requirements that you have full confidence in. And then we go in and start, you know, ongoing, building out your disaster recovery runbooks, 
operating your DRAS environment for you, checking in on your DRAS help and health, and then also routinely testing against that strategy and, and going back around that wheel again with the updates of what we've learned through the testing. So that if and when you do have to pull the trigger on your event, that we're ready to respond quickly and meet the RTOs and RPOs that we have mutually agreed upon and back that with a guarantee that you will be able to recover on the mutually agreed upon time that, that was set uh, in the planning stage. And if you go and look at our website, you can Google DRAS to AWS, we're the first result uh, in the organic search. We know this better than anybody in the space. And we have several case studies that demonstrate our capability to recover, not, from, not only from natural disasters, not only from power outages, not only from, you know, as, as, as uh, Rajesh said, fat fingers, but also from ransomware. We have several case studies on our website today that speak very directly to our capability of recovering clients' data and operations from ransomware attacks after they've been identified without that client having to pay ransom. And I, I just think that's, you know, an incredible thing that we're able to provide for our clients, that extra sense of security uh, beyond just firewalls and, and data protection. And again, this is all backed by the strongest SLAs to bring that guarantee for your confidence. We're, we're guaranteeing the infrastructure, the replication technology, our response time, and most importantly, what you won't see on other providers when you dig in is we guaranteed the R, we guarantee the RTO, the recovery time objective, uh, mutually agreed upon what we understand when you need to be back up and running, not just having your systems back on, but actually your ability to tap into those systems and operate again. We will guarantee that we can recover and we will put our money where our back mouth is with our SLAs and our guarantees. And that ultimately results in very happy clients. Uh, please, I implore you, if you're looking at updating your disaster recovery strategy and you're considering intervention, please do your due diligence. Uh, look on G2 Crowd, look on Gartner Pure Insights. Uh, we, you'll see that we have uh, some of the highest client satisfaction scores in the industry. If you know it, net promoter score, you'll know that anything above 50 is considered world class. We're at a 90 plus for our disaster recovery as a service solution. So again, we just we're very proud of the fact that we have very cl happy clients for this service. Um, this is an example of one of our case studies. You know, it's really just highlighting the partnership, the way we work with our clients. The big thing I wanted to highlight here is that by leveraging the cost savings of hyperscale cloud, we were able to save our client here at Land of Lincoln over 70% against what they were doing historically uh, with the secondary data center for the disaster recovery site. And we we're also able to prove out their ability to recover through our testing uh, strategy so that they could see that if and when, again, they needed to recover, their end users, their credit member union, uh, union members could get access to their applications when they needed them. So uh, it's, it's really, again, about planning, building the strategy, designing the run books, uh, the ongoing operations that we manage on your behalf so that you can get those guarantees and get the successful testing at a reduced cost than you're probably spending right now to manage your secondary data center for your disaster recovery strategy. So again, don't want to sound like a broken record, but please do your due diligence. Gartner and Forrester have recognized us as leaders and visionaries in the space uh, since the inception of the disaster recovery as a service magic quadrant. Um, we were in every year. Um, it's no longer a report, but we were in their most recent uh, industry insights for disaster recovery as a service. So please uh, take a look there. Again, do your due diligence on the, the guarantees. Uh, we, we, we know we have the strongest in the space and, uh, and it's really backed by you know, our, our SLAs and our guarantees. Uh, we will test with you until you have absolute proof of your recover recovery capabilities and document every step of your recovery process through the uh, disaster recovery runbook process so that you have complete confidence of who's responsible, who's accountable for every step uh, to get your operations back off and running. So for those of you who are considering taking a next step but aren't sure where to start, uh, one suggestion we have, one call to action is our resiliency maturity workshop. Uh, really, this is a low impact on your uh, team, but a very high impact in terms of what you get out of it process where our experts will come in, help you benchmark where you are today, identify gaps, set a clear understanding across your entire organization of where you need to be to successfully recover and build out that plan for you, whether or not you choose to work with InterVision. 
So again, if you're considering taking a step forward, I do suggest the recovery maturity workshop. One of our uh, subject matter experts will reach out to you with a recording of today's session and the ability to uh, connect with us to discuss your needs, whether it's a workshop or discussing more about what our disaster recovery as a service solution looks like. Um, so please, uh, you know, uh, feel free to respond there. But this is a great first way to engage your key stakeholders, get them involved in the conversation, define clear objectives and success of what your recovery strategy needs to look like, and then build out that actionable plan of how to meet that success criteria with the technology and what you need to have in place in order for your business to be uh, as resilient as it needs to be. So I think that covers it. Again, you know, I'll just leave here with this slide that not only are we partnered with AWS for disaster recovery as a service, but we also uh, provide full migration services. We have a guaranteed cost optimization solution. We combine that with our deep legacy and experience in the data center, and, and we believe that's what really makes us unique in this space. Um, and again, you know, I, I want to just say a very sincere thank you to you for joining us. And thank you to our guests. I'm going to turn it over and see if there's any questions here um, uh, on, uh, on, uh, from the audience. Uh, let's see here. So I'd like to hear from both Jeff uh, and Rajesh here. For organizations that are kind of not sure, you know, outside of this recovery uh, uh, maturity workshop that I spoke to, Jeff, what did your first step in this process look like of, of kind of engaging with, um, uh, you know, shoring up your disaster recovery uh, so strategy? Well, it really began with, with researching the options that were available uh, to us at the time. We, we knew that what we were doing was not working uh, the way we really needed it to work. So uh, when we started researching and uh, zeroed in on disaster recovery as a service, um, it really then meant understanding what we had in our environment um, and talking about the different tiers of recovery. Uh, and Rajesh talked about the the, the different tiers on AWS of, of uh, uh, pilot light versus the, the warm standby versus active active and really understanding which applications needed to go in which bucket. And uh, we worked with uh, some experts in that field um, and uh, found uh, a great way to divide up our applications. So they yeah, echo that. Yep. Yeah, they echo that, right? Like first figuring out what mechanism the customer currently has and then, you know, find out, right? Talk to an expert and find out where are the gaps and how they can improve, right? And yeah. that yeah. should be the first step. Excellent. Well, guys, I won't keep you any longer here. It looks like that was everything. Um, again, for those of you who would like to reach out to us today, please visit intervision.com uh, slash contact and you'll get to the contact form there. You'll hear from our experts within uh, 30 minutes or less typically, um, and you can start the conversation that way. But we'll also be reaching out with the recording of today's session and uh, you'll have access to that that you can share around uh, to any folks that wanna hear more. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you again to both of our guests. Thank you uh, for our partners at AWS and uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.